Welcome to the program. In this episode, we discuss media, media trends, specifically television and the future of how we consume mass media. If you think about the big trends in our lives affecting everything from entertainment to sports to politics to our general entertainment, just how we entertain ourselves and what the meaning of mass media is, the way we have consumed media has changed dramatically just in the last few years, let alone if you look back over the last 20 or 30 years. And whether you're speaking from a United States point of view, where this program is headquartered, or a global perspective, wherever you are in the world, what you consider mass media to be and how you consume it has fundamentally changed, which is fundamentally changing our society. And I thought it was important that we take an episode to talk with an expert who's been covering and is covering this industry because so much has changed so quickly. And there's so many aspects of this topic that we can cover. I thought it was important that we look at it through the eyes of a journalist. And so we invited Ashley Rodriguez from Business Insider to join us. She is their media editor covering the future of the television industry. Now, Ashley spends a lot of her time focused on the United States television market, but many of the trends taking place here in media are taking place around the world in different forms, particularly the rise of streaming video companies, specifically Netflix and Hulu, but also the... Disney Plus model, the ESPN Plus model, for those who are familiar with the sports network in the United States, and Disney and their their rollout of their channels. And around the world, streaming services like these and other local flavors and variations have become a much, much bigger part of how we consume media, specifically in a visual sense. Ashley also writes about the intersection of sports media and gambling in the United States, including companies like ESPN and DraftKings and the burgeoning startup space that's trying to capitalize on the new trend of gambling on live sporting events. Before Insider, Ashley covered media and marketing for Quartz. She also worked at Advertising Age, a very important media publication uh, here in the United States. She's taught uh, business journalism as well at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY. She can be reached at arodriguez at insider.com for those who would like to reach out to her. And you can find her on X at Ashley R. Reports. So we had a wide ranging conversation. We went about a little less than an hour. Ashley was very generous with her time and I do think it's important to cover certain industries with the level of detail that only a journalist who's covering this industry every day can bring. I certainly encourage you to visit businessinsider.com. If you want to find Ashley Rodriguez's stories, you can simply go in the search bar at the top of the page, search Ashley Rodriguez, and we also put a link to that page and all of her stories uh, on that page. Uh, in the description of this podcast, as well as on my website, brianjmatos.com. So I would like to present my conversation with Ashley Rodriguez for the rest of the hour. Ashley Rodriguez, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on, Brian. So we have been talking about the trends on this program for a, a long time, and one of the biggest trends that we see happening is media consumption, how people are consuming mass media in particular. And we will do our best in this program to cover the global landscape of this, though uh, much of our conversation will likely focus on the U.S. market. Uh, but we know there's been a long-term shift away from the old traditional media mass model, handful of over-the-air channels and your cable package, to a all-you-can-eat buffet of content generated and sent out through streaming services and on-demand services. So I want to set the table for our listeners about where you, who have been covering this industry for so long, where are we in that transition and that continuum? And what are the big trends that you are following today? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Brian. So here in the US, I think we're really um, smack in the middle of this shift from um, television and film um, now primarily to streaming. Pretty much all of the major um, media companies have gone full on in streaming now. You know, cord cutting is massive. 
I think that the projections are that pay TV is only going to continue to go down, right? So every major media company is now all in on streaming and it's having huge implications for how these businesses make money, right? Sort of where we are right now, everybody's trying to cut costs, they're raising prices, streaming services are getting more expensive and they're rethinking, you know, what kinds of content are we going to put on here and how much can we reasonably pay for content under these new models? I think another thing that's been really interesting for me to watch as somebody who covers the sports media world and the sports gambling world is how um, the, the local channels are changing, the RSNs are changing, and the impact that that's having on local broadcast, um, the local uh, sports market, and of course, the leagues themselves, right? These leagues uh, tend to uh, rely uh, rely a ton on their sports rights to, to make money, right? So the impact that the, that's having on sports overall has been fascinating to watch. And of course, the introduction and the expansion of sports betting and how sports media companies are starting to work more with gambling companies. You know, we're going to see the launch of ESPN Bet next week in the U.S. Um, so that's another really interesting trend to watch as we think about engagement with sports. So we're going to talk a lot about sports because there is so much changing in that. And I do think that has a ton of international uh, overlap and implications. Let's talk a little bit about you. You mentioned some of the pricing uh, pressures, and this is really to the business model of these companies. So you've talked to plenty of industry leaders, executives, and those who have to plan for the future. What are you hearing about the business models that may not be able to make it as we go into the next iteration of our mass market, our mass media market, and then who seems to be thriving out there and maybe is only at the beginning of what they can become? That's a really quick, great question. Um, I would say in terms of uh, what people are looking at in ter- like in the business model, streaming is just very different in terms of in terms of how you make money, right? You're really depending on subscribers to come back month after month and continue paying for your content. And that means you have to have new things. You have to have things that grab them month after month to make money, right? Which can get very expensive. So I think what we're starting to see um, is these platforms rethink what their content mix is going to look like, right? Do we need to really exclusively have um, all HBO shows on Max, for example, right? Or should we license them out to some other streamers and then we can make money that way as well, in addition to relying on these subscriber fees? Um, the the, The subscription costs are also going up, right? We're seeing Um, more platforms out there and they're going to be costing more. Apple TV is just the latest one to to raise prices. So people are, these companies are realizing that if we're going to really um, put all of our efforts behind these streaming platforms, we have to make money off of them. And quite frankly, I think the big shift that we're seeing right now is that investors are demanding profitability, right? They want to see that. Before it was enough to say, we have more subscribers, we're growing our audience this way. That's not the case anymore. Uh, In this current environment, investors really want to see profits. And I think that's why you're also starting to see platforms like Netflix that had never considered advertising before now start to bring that into their businesses and think about ancillary revenue streams such as advertising that can help um, complement the subscription revenues. Now, one of the lures of streaming services was that if you subscribe, you sort of skip the whole model of getting fed ads every 30 seconds, right? And now it feels like they're they're not getting enough necessarily from their subscription or they're concerned that they can only raise that so high. Are there concerns that as they become more of the traditional model where you are going to get fed constant ads, that that's going to turn away the value of the subscription? Um, that's a great point. It's quite funny, too, if you think about uh, the way that Netflix initially won against cable, right? Uh, it was cheap and uh, no ads. That was sort of like the initial value proposition. And now, you know, I think the price of Netflix has doubled over the last decade uh, and they've got advertising and all these other things. Um, look, I think that that probably was a concern at one point, but Actually, what we've seen with Netflix is that the uh, introduction of ads has been quite successful for them. I think the the at least here in the U.S., the 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 customer base is realizing that if they're going to have all these different subscription services, that they want optionality, right? They want the ability to have some that do have ads for a fraction of the price. And so you're going to see some people who are only going to want to watch ad free and they're willing to pay for that, right? We see that with um, every streaming service has 
tiers, right? Some will have ads and some won't. So they have that optionality. They have that flexibility available to them. But I think more and more consumers are going to be doing sort of a mix and match where you've got some services that you want ad free and you pay for more and others that you're willing to, you know, get that content for less money with ads. And are we seeing a trend between live streaming versus the on demand? Because obviously Netflix has has both offerings now. And in fact, most of the major streaming providers do. But there's always been this back and forth about what is the value of live anymore versus are the audiences all trending towards I want to watch what I want to watch when I want to watch it? And how are the industry leaders thinking about that audience choice? Yes, this is linear, uh, linear live programming and shift over to streaming is another thing that's probably last two or three years has been a big trend. First with these fast channels, right? These were linear channels that were sort of live, um, but had lots of different content throughout the day that was a little less expensive to produce. And so it wasn't as um, costly for them to carry a, say, like a cable channel, right? Now, a lot of that live programming is coming over in unique ways. We might just see on Netflix, for example, we might just see one li- one element that's live, right? Perhaps one production that's live instead of a whole live channel, live linear channel that's programmed throughout the day and that you need to feed content to 24-7. So I think we are going to see, um, you know, Disney Plus as well. I think they put Dancing with the Stars and certain shows available on their on their streaming platforms live but not everything needs to be live. And I think that's where we're really headed. There's going to be certain programming sports, for instance, Um, Amazon's going to, Amazon has Thursday night football and they're making that available live. Um, And then there's going to be other programming that it doesn't matter so much if we have it available um, to us live, right? We're not as concerned with the live audience. And so we'll, we'll see that remain on demand. Now, Where are we in terms of the profitability? You said before, like this has become the key for investors. And I think for publicly traded companies, we can see that, but we have other plenty of other uh, organizations out there that at least to the public is a little murkier as to where they are, or they're so deeply embedded in a larger company trying to pull out and extrapolate what's happening there has been tough. What are you hearing in the industry about where the continuum of profitability really is? Yes, that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, really, for the, the the legacy media companies right now that have made the shift to streaming, they're in a much t- uh, tougher position because they, they came a little later to the game than, say, Netflix, right? And they really had to make a splash. And that meant putting a ton of their content on streaming and in some cases, sacrificing the linear channels that had previously um, were the cash cows, right? And, and were most profitable and made them money because that, that whole model is, is on the decline. So for the major media companies, most of them are really challenged right now when it comes to profiting on streaming. Netflix, however, is um, figuring out a way to make this work. I mean, they did have a massive correction over the last year in terms of um, stock. It is is um, it has uh, really corrected over the last year, and it wasn't as um, soaring as it was beforehand. But what they're showing us right now is with the introduction of ads, users being back on the rise or subscription growth, I should say, being back on the rise, is that they have found a way to make this model sustainable. At least right now, that's what it looks like. And so I think heading into 2024, we're going to be in a really interesting situation where Netflix does seem to be coming out of this in a pretty good spot. I mean, they're keeping an eye on their expenses for sure. They're, you know, they just made an announcement. They're not going to be making as many movies as they had in the past, but they're going to be focusing on quality. So they are definitely keeping an eye on the expenses and, and, and their bottom line. Um, but they are in a really good position and a good cash position as well, heading into 2024, which is going to help them. And the studios, um, they're they're still they're still on that journey that Netflix had been on, right? Many of them are still spending a ton on content, and they they're they're not quite there yet. They're not quite there in terms of the profitability. Now, when we think about what the content creators are are trying to deal with, we just had a big Hollywood strike here in the United States. There were a lot of issues on the table, but streaming was one of the many that was just a concern about how that business model was changing and what it was going to mean for everybody in the content creation process. Um, I don't know that I was able to fully figure out from the media reporting or even from some of the union press releases about what was really on the line there and how they were 
looking at certain media companies versus others. Maybe can you help, especially those who don't live in the U.S. and only heard about this sort of secondhand. Can you break down what the issues there were that the media companies were in particular having a hard time working with the union to, to sort out? Because it felt like it was very core to the economic model, but also hard to understand for just the average observer. Certainly streaming was a big sticking point um, with the union negotiations. And if you think about the history of how actors and writers and people in the, the entertainment, the Hollywood community typically made money off of um, television and film, you would, you would make money, of course, for, for acting, writing, whatever. But then you would also participate in the profits if, you know, a TV show hits hundred episodes and goes into syndication around the world, you are then uh, enjoy, like participating in those profits as an actor. You're, you're usually getting a cut out of those deals, which is, uh, it used to be a hundred episodes was sort of like the holy grail to get into syndication, right? Um, on, the tel- on the film side of things, if a movie uh, you know, did gangbusters at the, at the box office, you would also get an end on the profits that were made on the box office for that film. Streaming comes along and we don't have that same um, one-to-one, we don't have the the same um, uh, data available into how an individual title performs. So if you look at a TV show, I don't really know how much money Netflix is making off of that, right? If I look at a film that's on Netflix, you know, maybe it's really popular, maybe they're telling me how many people watched it in the first 28 days, but I don't know how much money they made off of it the way that if I look at the box office gross, you can directly tie um, revenue back to that individual title. And so because of that, we saw actors um, and, and writers and producers and other people in the ecosystem sort of get cut out of the profit participation because that data and that information wasn't available to them. So that's really what changed here. Now, streaming does offer, they, they offer more money generally um, to talent up front because of this, um, but it still doesn't quite, uh, the equation doesn't quite work out if a, if a movie completely blows up, right, and becomes like a blockbuster. You're not going to get the same payoff that you would have many years ago with a, um, a blockbuster film that played in theaters. So that was really at the um, part of what was at the core of this. The, the actors were asking for more data so that they can understand how something was performing. Um, so the writers were asking for that as well from the streamers. And they wanted uh, participation in the profits. So we don't know uh, because the, the agreement that SAG struck with the AMPTP right now is still tentative. We haven't actually seen um, all that much information about what this new contract is going to look like. But from what I've read and heard, there is going to be um, there is some sort of a streaming participation bonus that, that the, the union has um, fought for. So it does seem like there is going to be some sort of a shift there and in, in giving a little bit back more to the talent when something is really successful. And how is uh, how easy is it for a content creator? We'll, we'll, we'll say traditional episodic programming to be able to move between the content distributors. So you remember like in the old days, if you had a television show on NBC in the United States, you're locked to that network and the agreements are ironclad and NBC sort of will determine what happens to your show and when it gets moved around and if it gets canceled or whatever. But it feels like now you see shows pop up on one and then they might not be able to renew there, but they pop up on the next streaming service and then they pop up on a network somewhere. And then some are, are everywhere. Is that a model that's actually changed where now the, the creators of these shows can sort of every couple of years, put the program out to bid and take the library with them? Or, or is there still that connection between distributor and creator? I think there is definitely still that connection between distributor and creator, but we have shifted away in the last couple of years from the, the, there, I think we hit a point with streaming where there was like this obsession with exclusivity, right? Netflix wanted everything to be a Netflix original. And so we want to own every episode of this that's ever existed. And we want to own the rights for future episodes in perpetuity and everything's only going to be on the platform. Right. Um, And in reaction to that, we saw the, the, the Hollywood companies um, lock in their biggest talents in these what what were called overall deals that would last several years, right? You know, we want J.J. Abrams to only work with us and we want first dibs on whatever he comes up with. So we're going to lock him into a multi-year deal. 
that was um, a couple of years ago. I think Hollywood has kind of shifted away from those because, again, the, the streaming model, it's just um, it it's a. Uh, it, it's just a little bit more challenging to make money off of the streaming model. And so now I think people are kind of not as concerned with, okay, we need to have exclusivity on our platform. And they're realizing that we can have things in more than one place. Um, so you're seeing people, uh, the studios not require as much of that. And as a result, if somebody passes on, you know, renewing, we're going to stop your show at the third, at the third episode, or I'm sorry, the third season, then you do have the opportunity to kind of go pitch that around and maybe an Amazon picks it up, maybe a Netflix picks it up and they, they keep the show going. Interesting. And then as you think about the business models going forward, we, we are still focused very much on how streaming is done today, whether cable channels will survive or not, some of the distribution fees there. Is, are there other models? Because certainly as I talk to young people, it's all about what's, what they can get at on their phones. And they really don't care who's behind it. And if they're distributing through channels like YouTube or through other video streaming services, to them, it's just about, I want to follow the content. I, I love a person or a program and wherever it goes, I go with it. So it feels like that creates an opening for pretty much any other form of distribution to come up. But I, I don't know what those may be or what those models look like. So are you hearing about anything, seeing anything? Is, is the investment community looking at different models that maybe haven't really made it to prime time yet? Yeah, I mean, it's it, certainly people are testing um, different things here or there. It's interesting, um, right? Co I think comedy is something that struggled because you you can get so much um, now great comedy on TikTok and other platforms, right? You can access comedians there. I mean, they have podcasts, right? There's just so many other ways for you to consume that type of content that maybe you don't need it on um, television or on in a film in the same way that you may have before. Um, it's been really interesting to see how some of the studios are starting to experiment with uh, TikTok, for example, uh, you know, putting, uh, you know, people watch episodes of Family Guy just in quick succession on, on these streaming platforms. I'm fascinated to see how that model evolves and if we start to see content that is longer form, but um, distributed in smaller chunks. And how that will work over time. I mean, it was a bit of the what Quibi, if, if you remember Quibi, the startup from a couple of years ago, it was like a bit what they were trying to do, but that was a subscription service and it didn't quite work. I wonder um, if experimentation over time will allow that that model to thrive still in, um, in a free setting where you can sort of make money from it through the platforms on advertising and in other ways. And it certainly feels, again, to the casual observer, that we went from a place of true mass media where there were only a handful of large distributors and almost everybody had access to those shows, whether they watched them or not, pretty much anybody anywhere could. And now we're in a place where there's a lot of bubbles. And like, if I have a couple of favorite shows on Amazon and you have a couple on Apple and somebody else is on Disney Plus and somebody else is just still in traditional television, we are in different bubbles. It feels like we're in like little micro media bubbles. I'm curious if that's something that the industry is, is thinking about because it feels like they're trying to get to smaller and smaller niches rather than the old model of let's get the biggest audience that we can get for our programs. Am I seeing that right? And, and do you think that's healthy for the industry or is that something that might break it down to such small niches that it actually makes it hard to, to get a consensus around our mass media culture? Well, we're certainly in uh, the era of fragmentation right now, that's for sure. I mean, the days where uh, you would have a show like The Walking Dead posting uh, 30 million viewers on a, on, a, on a Sunday night, right? We, we don't see those kinds of numbers in the way that we did before. Um, so there's certainly a shift where um, the platforms are trying to um, think more specifically about who their audience, but I mean, truly everyone, if you look at all the major streamers, everybody is trying to create more mass market content. Netflix in its early days, right, they were focused on indies, they were kind of, they, they were using all this data to try to identify these niche communities on their platform and create content that tailored specifically to them. And that model worked for a while. Um, but now when you're creating less content overall, you have to be more strategic and you have to have that content reach a larger audience. So I actually think that while maybe um, 
fragmentation kind of pushed us into this not phenomenon where we're creating content that's reaching more niche audiences. I think the the platforms are trying to go in the opposite direction right now. They want their content to to be more mainstream and to reach a wider audience so they can kind of get more bang for their buck. Um, we're also seeing a little bit of that happen in the sports world, which I think is interesting. We've seen, I, I don't know if you've been following what um, the Phoenix, the NBA teams the and or the NBA and the WNBA teams in Phoenix have been doing, but they actually struck a deal where their local cable channel, um, they no longer have the rights deal. That That's a whole other conversation. We could talk about the, the collapse of the RSNs. But essentially what they're going to do, they're realizing, well, the cable um, companies aren't or the the I'm, we're not going to be making as much from cable rights from these local channels. So why don't we just make it available free? And then guess what? We can reach hopefully a wider audience that way for our sports and maybe grow the sport and grow the fandom that way um, if we're not going to be able to get as much from the, this RSN revenue. That's interesting. So let's make the pivot to sports now because there's so much ground to cover and so little time to do it. Uh, and for our international audience that might not be familiar, RSN, Regional Sports Network, uh, here in the U.S., we, we have a, a large number of those and they're much more locally oriented. Uh, and I, I'm old enough to remember, I grew up in Chicago uh, and the uh, old and very disliked owner of the Chicago Blackhawks NHL team uh, at one point held his team off of local television because his attitude was, if you're not going to sell out my stadium, I'm not going to give you the content on your local television. So thankfully we're a long way from those days now. Uh, but as we think about sports, there's so many angles we could cover. Let me start with the one that feels like it's the biggest trend of the moment, and this feels also international, which is sports betting. Here in the U.S., our laws changed pretty substantially over the last decade or so to start to allow uh, active promotion of gambling in a way that had been prohibited in some states before. Uh, and so now there's a lot of companies that started up. And of course, sports is mainly the thing that people in the U.S. are, are gambling on. And sports media has tried to incorporate this into the essence of their presentation of the programs. Give us a little lay of the landscape. Uh, let's let's start here in the U.S. and to the degree that you can share what, what you know about what's happening internationally. You know, who who is ahead in this game? Uh, what is the business model looking like? Uh, and, and where do you think it's going? Yeah, so really this goes back to in the U.S. 2018, there was a Supreme Court ruling that overturned the federal ban against sports betting and thus um, states were started legalizing sports betting. Um, now, you know, more than half of U.S. states have sports betting legal in some form and online sports betting in particular um, has been taking off and that's where we've seen a lot of the growth. Um, we have seen a sort of the, the daily fantasy sports companies that were um, already established in the US, so DraftKings and FanDuel, really have taken off and led this industry. And they are um, kind of established a duopoly, to be quite honest. You know, some of the late, latest market share statistics show that they capture something like 70% of um, all the, the money that's being wagered on sports betting here in the U.S. And so those two, those two companies have just been massive. We've also seen um, media try to get into this space and media companies try to get into this space in different forms. Um, through partnerships with existing gambling companies. In some cases, they've tried to launch their own platforms, um, their own sports betting platforms. I think what the media companies learned uh, pretty quickly is that gambling is a really tough business to get into. It is a sports betting in particular is a pretty low margin business. The way that these uh, gambling companies have historically made money is often through um, casino games and these other things, right? So sports betting brings people in the door and it's great for engagement and for foot traffic. If you, you know, for casinos, that was often what gets somebody in the door. But you're making more money on the slots than you are typically on the sports book, right? So we've seen a lot of these media companies retreat to it to an extent um, in recent years from from sports betting and um, think about it more as um, a way to make money from advertisers, right? Because all the gambling companies want to advertise on ESPN on all the sports channels, and so. The sports media companies are making more money that way. Now, that said, uh, we've got a big sports media company in ESPN that is thinking a little differently about that right now. They recently struck a deal with a, a casino company called Penn Entertainment, and they're going to be launching next week uh, an ESPN-branded uh, ESPN uh, betting platform. 
So that's going to be really interesting for me to watch to see if this really changes the model between what a relationship between a media and a betting company can look like, because we haven't seen um, successful examples of media branded sports books kind of do well here in the U.S. um, in the past. Interesting. And, and for our audience who might listen to this podcast at some point down the road, we're recording in early November 2023. Uh, so if you end up seeing this, you're like, I already know about ESPN. Bet. Uh, uh, just for your reference, that's where that's where we are. All right. Um, so you mentioned it's a it's sort of a low margin uh, business sports book per se. So are you seeing the industry look at more strategic partnerships that would also include the actual casinos themselves, like trying to drive people to those facilities in the Northeast or the Midwest or wherever states that you have these large casino resorts? Is, is that the model is partnering with them to get them in the door and then having some sort of a partnership on site and in experience with the media company? Certainly for the gambling companies, that's what they're interested in as well, is to try to, for, for those who do have, um, Penn Entertainment has a large retail footprint um, here in the US. So for those that do have a large retail footprint, that's definitely a part of it. Um, that's something that uh, the Penn CEO, Jace, uh, Jay Snowden, has talked about is is wanting to sort of make use of uh, both Disney and um, Penn's uh, physical destinations and sort of physical touch points to sort of grow um, the audience for for sports betting and, and just for their other products. So that's certainly a piece of it. You know, Bet MGM, Caesars, these are casino companies, and that's that's core to what they're trying to do as well. I think from the media side of things, it's really about um, engagement for them. So sure, it's about the revenue that you can get from advertising and from licensing deals with these sports betting companies. But sort of the bigger thinking is that, okay, if we've got an audience that is betting throughout the game and, you know, maybe they have money on the line, maybe their friends have money on the line, they're probably going to watch more often, right? And they're going to be, you know, they, maybe they're going to watch the game to the end where before they might have just kind of checked in for the score here and there. So I think um, that's really the hope for the media companies is how can we use gambling and betting to really increase engagement and and get sports fans to to kind of come back to us more often, whether it's they're checking stats on our app or they're watching the game um, live. And how do the sports franchises, how do the teams look at this? Do they strike their own deals with these betting companies? Are they working with the media companies in conjunction with them? Uh, How does that relationship look? Yeah, it's a little it's a little bit of everything. Um, so there there's been a big big change, and I think how the major leagues once viewed gambling um, prior to PASPA were very against it. They've all over the past couple of years, the major leagues have all come to embrace it in some form or another. Um, pretty much every one of the major sports leagues in the U.S. has um, official betting partners, and so they've aligned themselves with certain sports books who have the right to use their logos, their um, their branding within the app so that they can kind of showcase bets that are around those sports. Um, Every major major league also has a data provider partner that is, you know, taking data from the league and it's making that available to the sports books so that they can kind of use that data to propel their odds and their pricing and things like that and create different bets around based on what's happening. So um, we're certainly seeing um, those relationships evolve more in terms of uh, the types of, of the types of data and information that the leagues are willing to provide to the betting companies um, and the media companies. And then how do the sports franchises and this we can apply this around the world to some of the biggest soccer clubs in, in the world. We know that they produce a lot of exclusive content for social media channels, maybe interviews with players, maybe some behind the scenes things during game days. And that's its own form of entertainment and its own form of distribution. But it's over and separate from the game day broadcast that they're still working through providers with. Have you seen any sports teams either domestically in the U.S., internationally around the world that are trying to do their own thing and sort of broadcast? themselves without having to work with a media partner? Um, Well, most of them are still working with the media partners, but it has been fascinating to see them um, really think about, I think, I think what we're seeing in terms of trends is the leagues really think about themselves as media companies. I think it was the NFL maybe last year or the year before that said that they wanted their sort of Marvel universe of of content to be built around the NFL, right? Docu-series, but also um, fictional, like films and 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 TV shows that are sort of center around football and center around the league. 
Um, we've seen a huge rise in docu-series, both in terms of production as well as um, demand for it. You know, everybody wants sports content right now. I think the best example that we've seen of this is with Netflix's Drive to Survive and what that did with Formula One in terms of creating a whole new audience for this, this sport. And everybody wants to try to create their own version of that, right? We're seeing it happen with college sports. We're seeing it happen all over the map. And it can have huge implications, especially for more emerging sports or sports that are trying to reach new audiences. And as we think about uh, the sports landscape uh, around the world, one of the interesting developments of the last year was here in the United States, our soccer league, which is nowhere near as popular in the U.S. as as the Premier League is in Europe or as La Liga is or any of those major European leagues. But nonetheless, it has a following. It has an audience. They took their entire media rights deal to a streamer with Apple, uh, which took them, as far as I know, it took them generally off of local television for the most part, if not always, took them away from regional sports networks and really forced fan bases into a subscription if you were going to continue to follow your team in that format. And maybe by a stroke of luck, it also happens to be the year that Lionel Messi comes to the United States and everybody wants to see his debut games and and they got a big boost out of that. So Give me a sense of how the industry saw this deal, first of all, about a streaming provider getting the exclusive rights to an entire league's games. And then if you believe that the uh, phenomenon that surrounded Lionel Messi and seems to have made that a success for Apple, is that really sustainable? Or is that something that you know is going to be difficult for, let's say, Major League Baseball to replicate mm-hmm. or a, a, let's say a major soccer league internationally to replicate? Yeah, I mean, for, in, for for the first part of your question in terms of how the industry looked at it, I think um, it it's both a risk or it's a bet on both Apple and MLS, right? These are both two unproven um, media brands. I mean, Apple is a well-known brand, but Apple TV Plus, their, their streaming service is still very new. It's still very nascent. MLS doesn't have, as you mentioned, the, the huge audience. And so not only was there um, there, there a big deal, the exclusivity that came through this, but also it's a 10 year deal, right? It's it's a long time, it's the next decade, right? So really this is a partnership that I don't think we've seen something quite like this before that's like, we are going to really work together to grow this sport in the US. I think that was the message that Apple and MLS sent um, when they did this deal. It's like, this is going to be a partnership. We're going to try to grow not only MLS, but like soccer as a sport in the US. And we think that we can do this. Um, and that's also why, I, I mean, this is this has only been reported from what I understand, but that's also why I, I saw the reporting that um, Messi is actually getting a uh, profit participation as well for the subscribers that that MLS service signs up through Apple um, once he once he came aboard. Um, so that that's an interesting kind of uh, twist to the relationship. I don't know if we've ever quite seen that before in sports where an athlete is getting a cut of the rights deal before. Uh, so so that's quite unique as well. And I think you only you can only achieve that. In a nascent sport, when you've got a, uh, a athlete coming in with massive, massive influence, the way that Messi has, um, is it something you can replicate? I, I I don't have a great answer to that. I'm not sure that you can. You know, there's a lot of um, unique elements that are kind of coming together to make this work right now. We've got a sport that's on the rise. We've got a streaming service that's clearly willing to put um, a lot of backing into making sure that this grows. And then we've got a star player that was really key to bringing this person over and helping the sport, sport, sport grow into the U.S. So if you can kind of create dynamics, uh, th- those sorts of dynamics, maybe there's a way, a, a way that you can parallel or recreate that internationally. Um, but it also does kind of feel like a bit of the the perfect storm happening right now, right? Like all these things uh, aligning at once. Yeah, and it was interesting just to personally experience it too. So I'm I'm a f- follower of our American uh, soccer leagues. I can't say that I watch every game. I don't follow every detail of it. Certainly the messy coming into the league made me pay attention more but the way that apple tv presented the programming they also had hours and hours of live content available on saturday night so if you just happen to be tuning in for something for an hour or two before you go on with the rest of your day i found myself just 
turning on Apple, leaving it on in the background, when maybe in the past I would have turned on the local news channel, cable channel, whatever. So it's pulling me away from those traditional channels of cable, of broadcast television, maybe even of YouTube or something else I might have done. Now, use case of one. Uh, that does not make a trend. But that's the kind of thing I was curious how other streaming providers looked at something like that as, is this something that is worth investing in so that we can just grab your attention and become the thing that you just have on in the background? And as long as you're streaming with us for three hours, we don't care if you were sitting there for it or not, you're, you were streaming it. Definitely we're seeing the streamers trying to get, I think, any any sports rights they can right now. Um, any, any, I shouldn't say any, any sports that are uh, sort of on the, on the rise right now, any sport that's growing, the streamers are trying to claw out a piece of that for themselves. Right. Um, we're, I don't know if you saw the NWSL deal yesterday, but Amazon is going to have, is going to be streaming some of those games. Um, that's women's, so women's soccer here in the U S. Um, and that's another sport that's on the rise. So, a lot of the the big ticket, the sort of premier media rights have been on um, those deals with the exception of the NBA, which is the next renewal to come. A lot of those deals are locked up. And so in the meantime, they're thinking we want to keep people around um, during the day. Like you said, we want to be that live viewing. We want to um, have those audiences come to us. And so where can we kind of uh, scrape out some rights for ourselves to really build something that feels like uh, feels comprehensive that people want to come back to us for? And then as you think about the advertisers, uh, they have always been the drivers for major media companies to determine what content they put out there. And then those media companies have to try to figure out how they can get the best and biggest advertising you know, uh, packages, rights deals. W what are you hearing from the advertising industry about where they're putting their dollars, what they like, what they're experimenting with that's helping drive some of the innovation in the media space? Certainly. Um, we're, well, we're certainly seeing a lot more of those dollars shift over to streaming, right? I think it was uh, for a while, it was this question of when it, are people putting, are actually going to move their, their dollars from TV, national TV to streaming? And we are starting to see that happen. So that I think that conversation, it's finally a yes, right? Like those budgets are moving. I think there's also um, a lot of uh, demand for content on social media. We're seeing digital bu digital um, budgets grow as well. And so that's also influencing companies to think about how they can use their social platforms more, both for audience engagement, but also um, to get advertisers. And are we seeing uh, any effects from the broader economy on advertising budgets and, and that they're squeezing their digital buys, they're squeeze, squeezing their streaming and television? So are they putting more pressure on the media companies to supply the ROI metrics? Certainly, that's been um, a big part of it as well. And this and this the last, you know, really probably the last two years, um, the budgets have been squeezed. And so it's been a much tougher much tougher sell, even around, um, you know, things like Thursday Night Football. I think it took a while at first for Amazon to really be able to get those advertisers to to vote budget to devote budgets to them, but now they are. Um, and so I don't know that budgets are necessarily going up, but um, streaming is still capturing a bigger piece of the pie, I would say, than it had before. And in terms of those advertisers' expectations, I mean, there was a time in this country where you could get 70 million people to watch any single event on a Sunday night. And that is, even the Super Bowl struggles to get those numbers if the teams are not from the right cities or you don't have the right halftime show. So now, you know, it's a huge deal if you get 20 million people for any sort of event during the normal course of the year. And a lot of shows, they have their little core audience of one or two million tops right across these networks so how do you, how have you seen you know advertisers react to this you have to chase your market all over the place with these little tiny pockets of of uh, communities that watch certain shows or certain digital channels i assume that they're not willing to pay as much to get a smaller audience but i assume the media companies want them to pay just as much as they ever did how, how is that tension in the industry playing out yeah, I think what's happening is that you're starting to see, or we have been for a couple of years now, is advertisers want to see a different kind of ROI. So if we're not getting the eyeballs or as many eyeballs as we may have had five, 10 years ago, then we want 
some sort of proof that like this is delivering for us in another way, right? So if I'm going to advertise with Amazon, for example, can you show me that people who are seeing my ad are actually going and buying things on Amazon or are they going on to my website, right? Like, like where are they going? How are they behaving after they've seen my ad? So I think we're seeing the media companies offer up different types of data to show that maybe viewership isn't what it was, but there's all these other ways that your, your ads are, are performing for you. And I think that's kind of the, the focus right now is for, for both advertisers and for media companies. They want to see ROI. They want to see some demonstration that um, people are actually engaging and responding to their ads and, and taking some sort of an action. So a long time ago now, the you know the Murdoch family comes on the scene and changes broadcast and cable and everything we know about television. I mean, here in the U.S., they were bold enough to launch their own broadcast network when there were only three major broadcasters. And of course, they changed a lot about how television was consumed here. We all know some of the impact they've had on the news business and the sports business. As you're covering this industry, is there anybody out there, any any investment group, any entrepreneur that has any of that sort of let's change the world kind of mindset that you're following or that maybe there's some chatter in the industry, that there's some name or some group that's really trying to fundamentally change the game of how we consume media, whether it's news, sports, regular broadcast, local television. Uh, wh wh where are the visionaries in this media space today? Hmm. That is a really, that's a really great question. It's a tough question. Um, off the, the, I would say... The biggest shifts that I feel like I'm seeing right now are mainly coming from the tech companies um, and trying to own a piece of the media, you know, companies like Google, uh, companies like Meta, um, Amazon, right, pushing uh, Apple, pushing into the space and trying to change the dynamic of what it means to be a media company and what the media industry looks like. I don't, doesn't mean there's not one out there, but there's not immediately a, a person, an individual who kind of like, like a, someone from a startup or something like that, who kind of comes to mind to me right now as sort of like being revolutionary or, or changing the industry. And and that's what it feels like. And again, as an outside observer, not watching the in intricacies of each business every day, it feels like the all all of the media industry sort of lacks that leader, that person who's pushing the envelope. And maybe what they do doesn't work, but it forces everybody to at least respond to it. It it feels like maybe Elon Musk was trying to do some of that with his Twitter acquisition, change yeah. the game on social, turn it into an all-encompassing thing. But but even that, it felt like it was more disruptive than it was visionary. And uh, I think any industry that lacks that driving factor often starts to stagnate a bit. And it certainly feels like the leaders of these companies are trying to figure out their place in this landscape as opposed to make a new space. Uh, but as I said, you cover the industry every day and you you talk to these folks, you might have a different perspective on that. Or, or you tell me if I'm wrong, maybe there are leaders who, while they're trying to maintain their space, they actually really are trying to find what the next generation looks like. I think everybody is trying to find what the next generation looks like. I mean, if you look at sports, we've got companies like Overtime that, you know, it's a younger company. It's focused on high school sports and, and, and or um, trying to, to get a Gen Z aud sports audience, right? That's, that's really their core focus. So there's definitely kind of smaller companies here and there that are pushing the envelope on in terms of what media looks like. But I guess if I think of, okay, what's the last big company that everybody in media like had to chase? For me, it's really still Netflix and, and Reed Hastings and I, we're, the media industry is still chasing them and, and reacting to that, right? I don't, I'm not sure that there's... Um, anyone in the last, if I think about like the last five, 10 years, that's had quite the same impact on media that Netflix has had. 
And I'm curious from your view, why do you think certain uh, traditional winners in, let's say, the cable business struggled so much to get into the streaming space? I think about here in the U.S., CNN for so long was just the name in news, whether you liked them or not. Uh, they just were. They tried their CNN Plus service, and it was gone in a matter of months. You know, ESPN, they launched ESPN Plus. It's fine. It's surviving, but it certainly didn't thrive the way the early days of that did. Is there anything about the traditional model that's just hard to replicate on a streaming 24-hour service and an on-demand service? I don't think that the big cable news companies, or any cable news company really, has figured out how this next generation wants to consume news. I think we've got a lot of um, younger people who go to TikTok, for instance, right? They, they go to newsletters, they go to individual personalities. And I don't think the cable news network model translates well to that environment. Um, I think everybody's trying to figure it out right now. Um, how do we bring that over? But I think that's the problem is that we just took what is a standard linear feed of news and, um, you know, hour long programming or whatever it is. And we just brought it over to streaming and we didn't rethink the way that people actually wanted to consume this content. And so I think that was really the big problem for news. For sports, it's been a little bit more challenging because there's, and maybe there's some of this with news too, but I think these companies were just so nervous about losing the uh, the cable networks that had sustained them for so long, right? I mean, ESPN gets way more money from the cable bundle than any other channel, right? And that's because its viewership has just always been massive. And they've got these hugely expensive rights fees that they have to pay for so that they can um, hold on to their live sports and keep their audiences. And so for the longest time, sports stayed on television and people continued being willing to pay for it. And they just didn't want to give that up. I think they were just afraid of cannibalizing themselves and they didn't go all in. And now they're being forced to. What are the questions that you're asking? What are some of those ideas that, that you have that you haven't quite been able to get a story out about um, that are on your mind, whether over the next couple of weeks or the next couple of months? Um, what do you want to know? Uh, from what's happening in our in our mass media markets. Yeah, I mean, in 2024, I'm really interested to see this how this dynamic is going to play out both in streaming and in sports betting, where we've got one or two people at the top, one or two companies, I should say, at the top that have a lot more money and are in a much stronger um, sort of cash position than everybody else that's following them. So in sports betting, it's DraftKings and FanDuel. In um, streaming, I would say it's Netflix, right? So I'm very curious to see how the market dynamics are going to work when you've just got somebody who's in a much strong position, stronger position than everybody else. How do you catch up? How do you sort of break up um, the or challenge the leaders who are at the top when they've got such a such a large lead? And then as you think about the the big risks out there to mass media companies. We talked a little bit about things like TikTok. How are they going to be able to deal with these short form social channels? Are there any other threats or any other you know, marketplace dynamics that you think um, executives are really having to try to navigate just to keep their companies at the levels of profitability that they have had? Yeah, that that that's um, certainly a time for attention is is huge right now, and it's not just social platforms. Like, I mean, TikTok is TikTok and YouTube have sort of taken over. Um, if you look at like recent studies of of teens, TikTok and YouTube have really taken um, attention. But it's also things like gaming, right? We're starting to see um, some of the media companies talk more about their gaming businesses and try to build that out because they're realizing that that's where people are spending more time. Um, so how these companies, which have been really historically slow to adapt to new technology and innovate, um, if they can they be faster, right? Can they start to move more quickly? I think will will be one. And then if you were giving counsel to, you know, those the next generation of leaders out there who are thinking about their companies and thinking about how they should be doing their marketing and how they should be showing up on these platforms, any uh, words of advice or counsel from what you've seen in this space about where where they should be focusing their attention as they're thinking about spending their own ad dollars and participating on certain mass media platforms? 
Yeah, it's been, um, I've been fascinated to see how um, influencers and sort of personalities and the role that they have in uh, helping grow various brands. So on, for example, on um, the sports side of things, we've seen some gambling companies re- lean really heavily into personalities, right? And and see that as a way, um, influencers, and see that as a way to grow their audience. It's sort of like word of mouth, but um, not quite. Um, I'm curious to see like what the actual conversion is going to look like for those. Is it just a way to sort of get people in the door or can you really build loyalty? Can you really kind of convert audiences by um, relying on an influencer kind of focus strategy? It's been a fascinating hour. Thank you for spending some time with us and our audience. If people would like to read your stories or learn more about you, where can they do that? They can find me on Insider. I'm a media editor at Insider, and I cover the um, the media industry, including TV, sports media, and gambling, and all that good stuff. And you're active on the social channels? I am, yes. I'm on Twitter, uh, Ashley R. Reports on Twitter. Excellent. Oh, I'm sorry, Ash- X. <laughs> we've already we've yeah. already lost track of the names of the companies yeah. and we will post links to that as well on the description of this program ashley rodriguez thank you so much for taking time to speak with us thanks for having me brian i thought that was a fascinating conversation we covered so much ground that we covered it from the perspective of an expert who's looking at the industry studying the industry asking the questions and In our next episode, we're going to take this similar topic, virtually the same topic, but we're going to take it from a slightly different angle. So I hope that you will tune in for our next interview and our next episode in our podcast series with Brian Mahoney. Now, Brian has been in the media, marketing, uh, and consulting business for quite a long time. So rather than covering the industry purely as an outsider. He has been an active participant in in various elements of marketing, advertising, communications, uh, and and having to be the buyer and and an advertiser on platforms. And so he's looking at it from a different perspective. And we're going to talk about many of the same themes, but I I think you're going to find some, some different perspectives. And hopefully between Ashley's perspective in this episode and some of what you're going to hear from Brian in the next one, it will help you think about how your company might consider the future of mass media and how you're going to reach your audiences, the kind of content that you may want to produce, the places that you may want to try to book your senior executives. The The reason I'm so interested in this topic is there's two reasons. There's three reasons, actually. Number one is Um, In the early days of television, like the early days of radio or even the early days of newspapers, mass media was dominated by just a few names, big names, trusted names. And the good thing about that was if you were fortunate enough to have your business be able to buy time on those programs through advertising or other placements or to get the free and earned coverage that comes with just being on the news – and uh, being talked about by trusted names, you were going to reach tens of millions of names, and there was going to be a credibility that came along with that. But now, with thousands of options for you to consume media, and some are more credible than others, and some reach audiences better than others, it's very difficult to just pick one or two or three networks and be confident that your brand is going to have been seen, heard, and been given credibility um, by tens of millions of people at a time. So with the fragmentation of the mass media market, it also means information is being fragmented. Brand awareness is being fragmented. Personality awareness. I mean, even down to television programs. One of the things that often used to bind us is that there would be a show or two or three shows that were big hits, and they were on one of the major networks or the major cable providers in your country, and everybody kind of knew the characters on the show. Maybe some people watched it more religiously than others, but we all had something in common because we were all watching something similar. This very rarely happens anymore. 
episodes air people don't watch them for a year two years three years down the road with so many new and exciting programs coming out on streaming channels if you don't subscribe to that streaming service or the premium cable channel or a satellite television provider or whomever on social media is airing a program you're just not going to see it or you may not see it for years down the road even if the show was very popular at the time that it was airing new episodes And so it creates a split culture. It creates subcultures. The people who love programs and are watching every new episode as soon as it comes out, those who are binge-watching entire seasons, and you're taking 14 or 15 or 20 episodes, and people are condensing that into one long weekend of viewing. And then others are just being left behind, and they've never heard of the shows or the actors in the shows or the plot lines of the programs. And so I think it's important for us to understand how people are consuming that media. So both as somebody who is thinking about how you buy ad time, but also as somebody who thinks about the impact on culture, I think these trends are very important. The second topic, uh, aside from the economics, um, is how it affects our politics. Um, you, You used to know that you could buy airtime on certain networks, and your message as an elected official, local, state, federal, uh, wherever you're running, would be seen by a critical mass of people. And whether they liked you or not, they were going to hear your message. That's just not true anymore. You have to be on so many different platforms, and then you have to engage appropriately on those platforms to be relevant, to be taken seriously. That's a sea change from where we used to be. And then the third element of this that's fascinating to me is the generational divide, is that you have older people generally who still consume media much the way they have their entire lives through more traditional and low-cost means like broadcast or satellite television. And then you have younger people who don't even own televisions. They get all of their media consumption on their mobile device, largely through subscription services or through social media, and increasingly those subscription services, they're only subscribing to one or two, and they're often not watching any of the live programming on those streaming services. They're only watching the on-demand content when they want, and it's often mixed in with other forms of media that's coming through social media that's much more short form. And I think that in addition to the fragmentation of our media, the difference in how it's consumed by age groups just further potentially divides the way we view the world. So I don't have answers to what all of this means, but I think these are important questions to ask, and it's the reason why I'm asking them of the smartest minds that I can find. So I once again want to thank Ashley Rodriguez for joining us today. A a quick reminder, you can find her on businessinsider.com, just Go to that website, businessinsider.com, search Ashley Rodriguez. You can read all of her stories, and you can follow her on X at Ashley R. Reports so that you can get the very latest articles uh, from, uh, from her and from Business Insider on this topic. And again, tune in again for our next episode when Brian Mahoney and I discuss this same topic from a different perspective. And a reminder, all... Every single one of our episodes are more than uh, by the time we get through uh, the posting of this program, the more than 20 episodes, including more than 15 interviews with critical industry experts, um, are now available to anybody free, no cost. You can subscribe through Apple uh, on their podcast um, store. You can go through Spotify. You can go through Google Podcasts. Um, Certainly, you can go through traditional players like iHeartMedia, Odyssey, um, the Libsyn app, where we host many of our podcasts, uh, our podcast episodes. Um, You can find us on uh, Amazon Music. How could I forget Amazon Music, one of the biggest distributors of podcasts now. Uh, And frankly, anywhere you get your podcasts. Wherever you subscribe, our show is readily available. I encourage you to find the program. Just search Brian J. Matos, and you can subscribe to this 
uh, series so that you get all the na- the newest and latest episodes as they debut. If you've missed anything or you're not sure how to get to those, you can always go to my website, brianjmatos.com. You can also visit my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com, search Brian J. Matos. You'll find my show clips and some exclusive content that uh, we are working diligently on for those who prefer that platform. As always, I thank you for listening and look forward to talking to you again on future episodes. And as always, I invite you and encourage you to stay curious.